So hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fisky virtual keynote session for um, Friday, July 26th. My name is Martin Brennan. I'm the Scholarly Communication Education Librarian at UCLA and the director of Fisky for this year. Um, it's great to have you all. We've had a great week of virtual courses, uh, 15 courses that have gone off um, seemingly without a hitch and um, a couple of more courses uh, wrapping up this afternoon. Uh, we finish up our virtual stuff uh, with this event today, and we start with uh, Fisky on campus on Monday morning. Uh, uh, keep in mind, too, that anybody that wants to attend any of the plenary sessions next week, uh, there will be Zoom sessions uh, for the opening plenary and for the closing plenary um, of the in-person so uh, look for those on the Whova site and you can join us for those sessions uh, as well. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Ivan Aransky, uh, who is the Distinguished Journalist in Residence at New York University's Arthur Carter Journalism Institute. He's the Editor-in-Chief of The Transmitter and uh, most relevant for what we're talking about today, he's the co-founder of Retraction Watch. Um, so uh, Ivan's going to explore the reasons for all of the increases in retractions um, over the last uh, 20 years, why it's good news and why the real numbers should be even higher. Um, and he's got stories to tell you. And um, he's joined by um, Martin Rittenman, who is a product manager at Crossref. Um, uh, Crossref is focused on documenting and clarifying the scholarly record in an open and scalable form. Uh, and Martin will describe the value Crossref sees in the acquisition of our Traction Watch database and plans for integrating it alongside the metadata provided by the members. So uh, we look forward to what they have to say, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ivan now. Thanks very much. <clears throat> thanks very much, Martin. Um, and thanks very much, everyone, for <clears throat> joining today. Um, I would normally say, you know, good morning or good evening, or but I think we're in so many different time zones. I'll just say great to see you all or see some of you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to apologize in advance for this rather gravelly voice, which I suppose I like. It's sort of interesting, but um, it's not for a great reason. I, I, I was sick earlier this week and I'm still... <clears throat> kind of, I guess, recovering from that, although I, I feel okay. Um, so let me, uh, I'm going to move that. Uh, I, I, um, I put out a poll, a couple of poll questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, just to sort of set, set the stage a little bit. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and uh, I don't see that many responses. So that's not to guilt you all. Uh, they may not be very interesting questions, but if you take a look at the Whova app, um, it might just, you know, be at least fun, if if not useful, to uh, take a look at those questions to kind of, you know, get a sense of what I'm going to talk about, uh, and uh, you know, help us help me sort of uh, understand where you're all coming from in terms of, um, you know, your understanding of the of the numbers or your interest in 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 what is going on. Um, so if you have a minute, great, and I may sort of look at that in a second. Uh, again, just to see if there see a couple more responses coming in. So that's great. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to make two claims today. Uh, one is that retractions are on the rise. Um, I don't actually think that's going to be a particularly controversial claim. Um, maybe it will be. We're happy to discuss that. Uh, but I'll provide some data on that. And I'm going to also make the claim that retractions are not rising enough, that they should be, in fact, growing even more quickly. And uh, that, you know, it's, it's somewhat speculative. I mean, predicting what should happen or what might happen in the future is obviously a bit risky. Uh, and I don't actually like to do it all that much, but I am quite confident here and I'll explain why. And I'll provide what I think of as the evidence for, the, for that speculation. But you will, of course, all um, help me think through that and judge it and frankly, hopefully question uh, anything that I'm claiming and claiming uh, and sort of question the evidence. 
my metaphor for today, which is a bit sort of gross, I suppose, but uh, I don't really apologize for that because I think it's important to focus attention, uh, is sort of sewage treatment, is pollution of waterways. And so the notion is we're, we've gotten much better at building and maintaining and sort of making more efficient sewage treatment plants, which sort of are at the, you know, um, the, the, the mouths of rivers that, you know, they prevent sewage, raw, untreated sewage from getting into oceans. Uh, what we're not really doing enough of, and I also think we haven't really prioritized, um, and needs to be a priority, is, is looking way upstream and thinking about why these things are happening, why bad science is happening, why the literature is being polluted, why the scientific uh, sort of, you know, sort of scholarly record is being polluted. And, you know, think about ways to prevent the pollution to begin with. Uh, and, and that has a lot to do with incentives, which I'm sure a lot of you have thought about. And I want to try and put together my sort of theory of all of that. So I'm going to get started. Let me look one more time here at the app and see uh, what kind of responses. Um, okay, we're getting to the double digits. That's good. Um, but I see, uh, I asked how many, approximately how many attractions have there been in scholarly literature, and I'm going to get to that number in a bit, but it's a sort of range of answers. Um, most, not most, but actually close to half of the small number of responses um, got more or less the right answers, about 50,000. Um, if you were above or below that, I'll explain sort of where the data are and where they come from. Um, I see, uh, looking quickly here at the answers for how many attractions should there be, um, I'm seeing you know, more or less something, many of you saying uh, a lot more than there are, uh, 10x, uh, you know, 100, and then, but also uh, some people saying uh, 100 per year, which obviously would be a much smaller number than we're seeing now. So range of responses, I like that. Uh, and I'm hoping to uh, help you think through that today. So um, there we go. All right. So here's part of the answer. It doesn't give the entire answer to uh, what I was just asking, but you may have seen some of you or all of you this article in uh, Nature on the journalism side of Nature last year in December, early December, uh, showing that there was a dramatic rise in the number of attractions last year, in fact, a record, although, as you can see, there's sort of frequently a record. This is an absolute number. Uh, by the time, and it says, you know, 10,000 last, surpassed 10,000 last year, actually, by the end of the year, by, all, by the time the dust all settled, it was about 13,000. So even this is already out of date, which is understandable. Um, and that, you know, there's a couple things to note. One is that that's an absolute number, again, not a rate. And so on the right, I've added the rates since uh, 2002, or at least a couple time points. Um, in 2002, the rate of retraction was roughly one in 5,000 papers. Uh, last year, and again, given this rise, it was about one in 500 papers. So the overall number to answer the question uh, that I posed is something like 55, 56,000 right now. Um, there are about 50,000 in our database. Actually, there are just more than 50,000 in our database now. I'm going to talk more about that in a bit. Uh, we know we're missing some, which is which gets me to the back to the what happened last year, which is that, and it's, it wasn't just 8,000. It was closer to about 11,000 over the course of about 18 months in Dawi, which was acquired by Wiley in 2000. 21, uh, actually, they had to retract or they did retract uh, about 11,000 papers. Uh, and we're still catching up with them because we enter everything by hand, as I'll explain. And so that that was responsible for many of them. And in fact, if you if you do the math on 13,000 from you know one year out of 50,000 ever or 55,000 ever, you're, it's roughly 25 percent of all retractions happened last year, which is going to sort of, I think, hopefully make you think about you know, why is that? What does it mean for future trends? And also just, you know, well, what does it mean? Um, so again, as a rate, these are clearly on the increase, on the rise, a 10x increase. Um, they're still pretty rare, right? 0.2%. Uh, that's, again, one in 500 papers. But it's also not negligible, right? That's not a zero number. So I'm not going to go through all of these sort of in the interest of time because I want to hear from Martin and also uh, have a conversation about all these issues. 
Um, but I just want to flash up here sort of various reasons for attraction. These are not in any particular order. Uh, we, you know, we, we have data on all of them, which I'm happy to share. Uh, and frankly, which is publicly available, but we've collated it. Um, so, but these are kind of the kinds of reasons for attractions. And I want to make one general point, which is that about two thirds of the time, retractions are due to something that is generally considered misconduct. So whether you use the sort of official definition of fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism, whether you use something like, for example, paper mills, which there may be some cases where those are real papers, although that's probably not too many cases. Uh, but that is something that, you know, obviously you're falsifying the, the, the uh, scholarly record. Um, fake peer reviews is still one of our favorite kinds of narratives at Retraction Watch. It's responsible for at least 3,000 retractions in our database, uh, in the Retraction Watch database, excuse me. Um, that is when someone actually has managed to peer review their own paper. And so those of you who are scholars in the audience might think that's terrific. How do I do that? Um, I, well, you shouldn't do that because it's broad. Uh, but also you'll probably get caught at this point because we and others have written about it. But it's when people actually use fake email addresses to make themselves look like somebody else when they're you know when they're asked for suggested peer reviewers. It's a pretty bad practice. But um, again, we first discovered this in about 2011 without really understanding what we were looking at. Uh, but since then, there's been obviously a lot of developments in that. Uh, lots of other reasons here that you've probably heard about, uh, particularly image manipulation. This is something that there are sleuths who I will get to in a moment uh, who focus on that and, and what have you. So I, I just want to, again, just put these out there. Happy to discuss any of them later. But these are the kinds of things that we're seeing in terms of misconduct. About 20% of the time, retractions are due to honest error or what we would sort of colloquially refer to as honest error. Um, but I think that uh, sometimes people... I think either wish there were more of those. In other words, people were incentivized to, and we certainly are among that group, uh, or sort of um, wish that there were different categories for those kinds of retractions. Our general thinking, and the data from economists supports this, is that it's much better to think about good retraction notices, uh, which I'm going to talk about later on, than it is to necessarily sort of have these sort of different categories. Um, not surprisingly, ChatGPT and other generative AI has started to, uh, you know, sort of trend into the scientific literature, the scholarly literature. Um, we have about 100. We keep a list of papers that have clear um, indications of ChatGPT use, but where it wasn't disclosed. If it's disclosed, a lot of publishers are fine with that. But we have about 100 papers on there now, and there are actually a whole bunch more that we have to enter. We just haven't gotten to it. Uh, but this is a list. It's not supposed to be comprehensive. It's just to give a flavor um, in fact, there are also some peer reviews that we found that are you clearly using ChatGPT without disclosing it. So this is, um, it's a new trend. Uh, one could argue it's just simply, and I do, that it's just an exacerbation of existing trends, that it's something that um, is more of a symptom of the real problems in the scientific literature, which I'll get to, than, you know, sort of its own problem that we have to jump to do everything, something about. We should jump to do something about it, but the problem is that if we do that, we will lose, really, you know, lose sight of the forest for the trees and um, not remember that something else will come along, if, even if we vanquish that. Uh, we, <clears throat> we like to uh, keep lists at Retraction Watch. We listed lots of things. Um, this is sort of a, a sports leaderboard of, of retraction holders. Um, these are the people in the world with the most retractions. Uh, we update this whenever someone sort of changes ranking or, you know, changes number. Uh, we actually updated one of them just this week. Uh, number seven is new to the uh, to the top 10. We, we go down to 30. <clears throat> There's a couple of things to notice about here. Um, one is the 220 attractions is an awful lot. And, and I just want to note that for the vast majority of these cases, all the attractions either happened at once or the knowledge that their papers were problematic at all happened at once. It wasn't that they, you know, had a retraction and it kind of kept going. It was that there was an, something flag got flagged, some kind of investigation or multiple investigations, and then boom, they didn't all necessarily happen at once, but they, the the knowledge of them being problematic all happened at once. Um, <clears throat> another thing is that there happened to be a lot of Japanese surnames on this list. That's kind of a, that is an artifact. It, it has to do with the fact that there are a lot of anesthesiologists on this list, and there are groups in in uh, Japan that have ended up working together and publishing a lot together. So you're actually sort of counting some of the same papers twice, just not the same authors. Um, <clears throat> anesthesia is actually part of the 
it's it's it is overrepresented in this list and probably in retractions in general. Uh, and that's because that's a that's for a good reason. It might sound a little strange for me to say that, but what I mean by that is that uh, anesthesiology had an awakening uh, in about 2008, 2009. It's actually the work of my co-founder, Adam Marcus, who sort of not discovered that, but who reported on that and told the world about it. And ever since then, anesthesiology has realized they had a problem and are trying to clean up the literature. So it's a good thing, but it means they have more attractions. Um, <clears throat> other fields have had the same issue, and, and you may know about some of them. For example, cancer biology and social psychology, which are also represented on this list. The other demographic information sort of data point, though, on this is on this list is that there are no women on this list. In fact, if you go all the way to 30, there are no women. on. on there's one woman, excuse me, on the entire list. Um, and if you control for, in other words, you account for the number of, you know, men in science and publishing and all of that, it turns out that men are still nine times more likely to have papers retracted for misconduct or for fraud uh, than women are. I, I'm not sure what to make of that. Somebody smarter than me might actually have better ideas, but um, it's an interesting data point that has held quite consistently since we've been doing this. Um, so why are all these? Okay, so. Retractions are on the rise. There are people with a lot of them. Um, the Most of them are for uh, misconduct of some kind. You know, why the growth? And I, I think there's a sort of, I'm going to talk now about the proximate reasons for the growth. In other words, the downstream effects, the, the people who are building and maintaining the sewage treatment plants. This is them on the, on this on the screenshot, which is just a couple of screenshots from a poster retraction watch, which we, again, we update periodically, this one's probably already out of date because we we keep adding profiles and stories about these people. Um, and I saw that from uh, one of the answers to the polls that uh, at least someone and maybe a couple of you are, and I'm sure probably all of you or most of you are familiar with the work of Elizabeth Bick, who's pictured here. Um, you may not be familiar with the work of Michael Doherty. He, he focuses on, uh, so Elizabeth Bick focuses on image manipulation. Michael Doherty focuses on plagiarism. It's actually a philosophy prof professor at a Catholic university and has found <clears throat> a lot of plagiarism among uh, bishops and, uh, and people, their theses, uh, and also other things that they've read, other things that they've written. Fascinating story. But what happens is each of these sleuths, really, they, they specialize. So some do image manipulation, some do plagiarism, some do uh, sort of statistical anomalies or other problems. And or IR, lack of IRB approval is another reason of now growing for attraction. So th they're the people doing the work. Now, you know, publishers know this um, and uh, sometimes acknowledge it. Uh, I think they should acknowledge it much more, but these are people whose work has been made possible, not by some huge grant or some resources. They have no, the vast majority of them are doing this for free. I mean, I'm also a volunteer at Attraction Watch. We have funding for other people's work. The, they, you know, they're doing it and they're also at risk of lawsuits and things like that. Um, but their work is possible because of technology, uh, because papers became, you know, came online, uh, give or take 25 years ago, much more than they had before. And so people could actually do the kind of work that, that you need to do in order to find issues in the literature. Um, but it's also true that, you know, publishers have been quite slow, the vast majority of them, not all of them, but the vast majority of them to actually sort of realize they had a problem or acknowledge they had a problem, they may have realized it and actually sort of start to do this kind of work themselves or at least incorporate the work that sleuths are doing. But that is, to be fair, what is responsible for the growth and attraction. So there's some signs of change. Here's one sign of change. A lot of research, a lot of journals, we didn't write this headline, we did write the story, uh, wouldn't have chosen the word czars, but uh, research integrity managers. So people who are actually tasked with looking at these allegations, looking at problems, sometimes before papers are published. Uh, that's actually much more, I think, pr productive, but certainly they need to clean up literature afterwards. So some journals are hiring these uh, these people in-house. Some have had them, a couple of journals have had them for more than a decade, uh, but some are still getting to it. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm going to now sort of say, and and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you some specific numbers, uh, one specific number. Um, so again, retractions are on the rise. Proximally, the reason is that people are actually looking for these problems and have the wherewithal one way or the other and the technology. Some are starting to use AI to find problems. So that's actually a productive use of AI. Um, and so it's on the rise. And I'm saying, and my claim is that it's because mostly, if not 
almost exclusively, if not directly the work of the sleuths, the work of the sleuths has prompted this kind of movement. Um, I'm also going to say, and this probably won't surprise anyone, that I think there should be far more attractions. And I saw, again, some answers about what number of attractions you think there should be from, from those of you who answered. That was a free text answer, so there's a, lot, a range of answers. Um, we, based on a couple lines of evidence, which I'm going to present now, uh, we think that the right number should be about 2%, so about 1 in 50 papers. And that's according to you know, sort of what would qualify for attraction by Committee on Publication Ethics Guidelines. And those typically, those are almost universally used by uh, by journals, even if they're not Koch members. And so if you look at this uh, article, this comment piece from 2016 from David Allison and colleagues, his grad students, his postdocs, um, they found problems in 24 different papers. Uh, only eight of the journals ever actually wrote back to them when they asked them for, you know, sort of what they might do or when they raise these issues. That's That's a pretty small percentage, small numbers. To be fair, um, Elizabeth Bick, who I mentioned, looked at 20,000 different papers and found 2% of them, which is where this 2% is starting to come from for us, um, you know, had uh, figures that, that with features suggestive of deliberate manipulation. Um, that would be grounds for attraction based on COPE guidelines. And so, again, 2% of a much larger sample size, right? Not, a, not all the papers in the world, she didn't look at them, but as a sample size, that's pretty large. Um, more there's other evidence one one particular line of evidence which i want to mention i didn't include a slide on it but which i want to mention is that in 2009 uh, danielle finelli and, and colleagues published a uh, in it was in plus medicine <clears throat> a, a sort of survey of surveys a meta survey if you will that found that two percent of researchers admit to committing misconduct if you ask them in an anonymous survey so you know again this number is all adding up do i have absolute ironclad evidence that it's two percent i do not and if i ever claim that either the world has changed or i should be not held very credible however if i'm asked which i often am to speculate about what percentage is likely two percent feels pretty right to me part of the other reason for that the other line of evidence is that these take so damn long so these are all headlines from retraction watch two of them the bottom two are when we actually obtained letters through public records requests from universities, official letterhead, asking for attraction after an investigation, and the journals did nothing. So two years, three years. And the cynic in me says, well, that's exactly how long citations count for impact factor. I mean, that may or may not be what's going on here, but it certainly makes me think about it. Um, but these are taking so long because publishers are not prioritizing it, or until recently have not prioritized it at all. Now some of the publishers are actually prioritizing paper mill of attractions, which I suppose it's a good thing, but could kind of distract us. <clears throat> but anyway, that's what's been happening. The other th one of the thing, other things that happens is that lawyers get involved, and so they threaten to sue. Um, some of you, many of you may be familiar with the Francesca Gino case. Uh, this is someone who's now on administrative leave from Harvard, but she was accused of, and actually by Harvard found to have committed misconduct. She's now suing both Harvard and the people who the her accusers who. Um, unveiled, you know, we uncovered the problems in her work. Um, I, I should say alleged problems, I suppose, but Harvard did find that there was misconduct. Um, she's suing them. And so that, of course, slows down the process, although there have been some retractions here. It's the fear of lawsuits that often, and, and publishers tell us this, that they're very sensitive to legal threats. Um, I have feelings about that as a journalist, and I, um, I sort of, I'm vaguely sympathetic, but also I uh, think that there's a responsibility to do the right thing, to clean up the literature if you're going to stand by it. Uh, but that's a real thing. And Adam and I, uh, again, Adam Marcus, my co-founder, and I wrote a piece about a year ago now in the Chronicle of Higher Education looking at some of these cases. So what ends up happening? Well, publishers are slow, opaque, and inconsistent. That's not my words. Those are words of this group of people, this group of researchers who have actually been responsible for finding problems that led to a couple of the people in the leaderboard of retraction, so people with a lot of retractions. After a year, more than half of the pub, of the journals they contacted had not gotten back to them to tell them what they were going to do. A year. Um, I'm sorry, something takes, you know, a couple months. I understand that. These are complicated cases, but a year. And that just, again, keeps polluted literature in the, it keeps pollution in the literature. And I think we should all be concerned about that. House of Commons, or maybe some of you uh, watching from the UK or um, uh, just know about one of the committees had a report, which I gave testimony to, along with a number of others, 
a couple of years ago, and they said this should only take two months. This process. It's not clear what the when the the start of the two months is. Is it when the paper is found to have problems? Is it when someone requests a retraction? But direction. So the 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 actual time not quite clear. That's correct, but directionally they're saying look this is taking too long like the literature is remaining polluted and so that's to me that's the important thing the two months you know you can we can argue about it or debate it but it's different um one thing i do want to note because although i'm obviously uh, you you could say a critic of the of a lot of players in this uh, in this space um i do want to because i think it's really important if nothing else than for my credibility and for attraction watch credibility to point out when things seem to be going well. And these are two uh, studies, actually, that just came out in the last few weeks, last month, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, you probably can't read that. It's it's pretty small on now looking at the slide, but uh, you can look up the papers, of course. Uh, one is a study that looked both at whether or not public health retractions, retractions from public health uh, journals were actually noted uh, very often, and also whether the retraction notices were complete using our guidelines and also Committee on Publication Ethics Guidelines. Um, we also took part in a study which was covered by Chemical and Engineering News just th this week um, about that. Uh, so you can, if you look up that story, uh, and I can provide all these references, of course, but that'll get you to the study we did or we were part of. Uh, we were middle authors on that. But uh, one of the first one actually in a very limited data set found that there wasn't much change. In other words, there wasn't the, the retraction notices. Well, they didn't find change. They actually looked at one type data point. Uh, one time point, but they found that retraction notices were still very often lacking. We found that they were lacking, but that there was some improvement in one publisher, Springer Nature, uh, in the sample that we looked at. Um, Wiley did not uh, sort of show uh, sort of a, an improvement in, in that sense. So, but again, maybe some signs of change. Getting back to Wiley and uh, Hindawi, which I mentioned briefly. Um, <clears throat> again, Wiley purchased Hindawi in 2021. And that was a very large, um, you know, open access publisher, all based on article processing charges. You're probably all familiar with this. <clears throat> um, this, the reason I mentioned this particular development is that because Wiley is a traded company, this has made it into the pages of the Wall Street Journal. It's made it into Wall Street and in general. And so uh, Wiley's stock price actually took a big hit, 16% on the day they announced that they had, their special issues had been basically overrun by paper mills, right? Which I'm gonna talk about in a moment, talk about what those are. But this is not just a sort of scholarly inside universities and inside institutions story anymore. It's everywhere. And you're probably all aware of this. Literally in the space of in the first six months of this year, there were multiple front page stories in New York Times and Wall Street Journal about related issues in scientific publishing and like not good for the industry, I don't think, but maybe a good wake up call. So one of the, you know, so we talk about pollution and there's sort of the pollution that we aren't even retracting, which I think is the bigger problem. But there's also the pollution that has actually been pulled out of the out of the river. And here's where the metaphor breaks down, but somehow still pollutes the ocean, even though we've pulled it out of the river at the mouth of the, of the river. Um, and so when you look and Alison O'Brien, who's the third author on this, is our, is our research director of Traction Watch. But this study actually is just reproducing what a lot of other studies have already found. <clears throat> so it's a good reproducibility story in that sense, although the data aren't very exciting, aren't, aren't very encouraging. More than 95% of the time, when you look at the biomedical literature, retracted papers are still cited as if they'd never been retracted. And that should really concern us, right? And, you know, why that's happening is subject to lots of actually further study. <clears throat> but that's bad, right? We don't want to be... Um, citing work that has been retracted as if it hasn't been retracted. Part of the reason, and one of the authors on this is actually one of the co-authors of the paper I showed you earlier about, uh, you know, status of retraction notices now. <clears throat> part of the reason is that publishers have not typically been very good about uh, sending the metadata, in other words, transmitting the metadata. And Martin's going to talk more about this in different ways uh, in a moment. But <clears throat> they have not been very good about actually getting those metadata in front of, you know, indices and other places, or even sometimes their own sites. In other words, their own abstract pages and things like that, uh, which is why we decided to create the database, uh, the Retraction Watch database. Um, but here you just have one example, and 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 you could I could find lots of references like this where 40% of the time, and again, that study that um, Caitlin, one of the authors was involved in, found 
It was actually like 5% of the time in, in this, in the public health literature. So, and Martin's going to talk more about this, so I won't spend too much time, but we were really excited to be able to announce along with Crossref that Crossref had acquired the Retraction Watch database. Uh, this is not quite a year ago now, last September, um, which makes the data available to anyone uh, for, you know, completely open use for whatever you want. And one of the ways that we think it's really already had been used and will, you know, hopefully uh, this will only grow. And it, actually, we know it's already grown uh, in various ways is by, you know, bibliographic uh, management software, things like that, where EndNotes, Otero Papers, um, discovery platforms like Libkey Nomad, Edifix, which is really a sort of, um, it helps people write manuscripts, you know, uh, prepare manuscripts and does retraction checking. So you can, again, if you are using any of these products, it turns, you, you actually are getting uh, automated retraction alerts already uh, using the Retraction Watch database. Um, all of that is just going to accelerate now that the data are completely available. We had to license it for long, you know, for about five years because we needed to be able to continue the work, right? You can't build the most comprehensive uh, database of retractions. It also has reasons for retraction, which doesn't appear anywhere else, you know, without, you know, significant resources. And so and we, we do things on the cheap, you know, we are a very lean organization, but we still need to pay people um, and, and have other uh, costs. <clears throat> so we're very delighted of the way this uh, this um, acquisition happened. Martin can say more about that, but we just think it's a really positive development. So um, I just want to mention, I'm going to, in the last just few minutes, I'm actually mostly going to get to the sort of way going way upstream, and I'll do that pretty quickly. But I do want to mention one other sort of resource that we offer that is, it's related to, you know, and it's related to attractions, it's certainly related to pollution of the, uh, and there was a story, a very nice story in Nature this week about uh, hijacked journals, and it mentioned the Retraction Watch uh, hijacked journal checker as a resource. These are journals that um, basically what happens is they, they're usually very small journals, uh, maybe they're one-offs for, uni for universities or societies. They, maybe somebody forgets to um, renew the domain name, you know, or the, the URL. And so somebody pounces on that and they turn all of their machinery, the peer review machinery, the and the and also the ability to accept article processing charges and other fees, they turn that toward their own completely unrelated company. Um, it's a scam. Um, you could argue it's fraud and and maybe even criminal activity, uh, but it's certainly a misrepresentation. There are about two hundred, actually more than two hundred fifty journals that have been hijacked this way, um, and we, along with uh, Anna Abelkina, who really does the work here, we partnered with her. Uh, and we make this available for free. You can go, there's the URL. Uh, but you can also just search for Hijack Journal uh, Retraction Watch, you'll find it. Um, but we think people should be aware that, you know, are you actually publishing in the legit journal or not? Um, so that's another thing to mention. So again, in the last just couple minutes here, let me talk, let me move us all upstream. Let's let's row, the, row, row, row the boat, um, you know, go way upstream and and, you know, try and figure out why all this stuff is, you know, what are the incentives? What are, what's actually leading to the bad behavior that is therefore leading to attractions uh, and to stuff that isn't even being attracted? And I, and I want to sort of stake a claim that I, I, I find it co a compelling argument to be made that the problem is rankings and citation culture. Um, so rankings, as we all know, there are many of them. This is the Times Higher Education Ranking System you know, pretty, pretty widely uh, used and, and looked at. <clears throat> These dictate funding, they dictate reputation, they dictate all sorts of things. So there's, it, it, they're really, it's not just a sort of nice thing to have. For a lot of universities and even countries, and they rank themselves too and, and rank against each other, um, this is the coin of the realm. This is how things work. And, and should be, again, depending on, your, on where you are in the world, there may be different ranking systems, but what they share is that citations are a massive percentage of what happens of what are kept uh, in in uh, in mind here. And so, or what counts. So here, 30%, it's actually more than that. Research productivity is also mostly a lot of citations. So a third of rankings at, at times higher education are governed by citations, which means that, you know, well, if you're going to try and up your ranking, where are you going to focus? You're going to focus on citations partly because you know, you just understand them and also in the clearest metric, but also because they're easy to gain, right? And so what are people doing? They're actually in either directly or indirectly paying people to cite their work. 
So that might mean literally paying people. We have cases where publishers have said, if you, you know, we have this one case here that's mentioned or others, um, but sometimes it's more indirect and the more indirect. And so is when, and I'm going to get to some stories about that. So I'll leave that for a second. Um, we have universities uh, and yes, China is the biggest sort of, you know, circle here, but United States, Western Europe, other parts of the world are also, there are universities that do this in order to get cited, you need to get published in order. And then, so universities are paying cash uh, and they're still doing it. Maybe less so, maybe different places are, but they still pay cash, cash bonuses for publishing papers, or it's just, which wouldn't be here, but is pretty universal. You have to publish in order to get, keep your job, which again, or get a job. I think we all know what publisher perishes. That's what, that's where this comes from. Um, universities are actually giving, uh, not giving, but they are uh, offering and then paying uh, researchers, scholars, established scholars to be adjuncts or uh, fellows or some kind of visiting lecture or something, honorary fellowship, something like that, where what you do, you have, to, all that you have to do to get, to earn real money, like $70,000 US a year is, you know, include as a tertiary affiliation your whatever this university is. And so those count. And until quite recently, nobody had noticed that, even though this story is quite old and people apparently didn't pay attention to it. So all the metrics were counting all the citations as if they were sort of the core primary affiliation. And so you'd have universities that all of a sudden were top five in math that no one had ever heard of being good at math before, purely for manipulating citation. You even have cartels, right, that sort of figure out. And, and the use of sort of organized crime language here is not coincidence. It's not unintentional. It's very intentional because that's what we're dealing with. And just to, to sort of summarize on what's probably not a very positive note, not summarize, but to conclude here, I mentioned paper mills briefly. I want to just explain what I mean by them and then to sort of have you understand how this all, again, goes downstream. And, and this is really upstream even, you know, creating this industry, encouraging this industry, making this industry th thrive. These are headlines from Attraction Watch, but you can find these everywhere else too now paper mills they can actually sell you paper so you need to publish something because that's a requirement of your job and you don't know how to do that or you don't have time or you just want to get it done you call a paper mill and you go online and find a paper mill they will go through the whole process for you they've probably sold that paper to somebody else so you've just basically plagiarized someone as well as done something very you know problematic uh something else problematic but you can also buy authorship so you've got a paper that's you, uh, as an author, have a paper that's accepted, basically ready to go, and you say to the publisher, oh, I have a new author, another author I forgot to mention. Well, that's because you went onto a brokerage site, and you said, if you want to be an author on this paper, because you need it for tenure or whatever else, for a job, pay me $500, and you can be an author. And we've got now hundreds and now thousands and growing to thousands of cases of where publishers have realized this. Um, this is all what now, again, I don't know if we want to call good news, bad news. Otherwise, this is a sort of very predictable outcome of, again, citation culture, rankings culture. Um, and if we really want to fix this problem, yes, we need to keep finding more problems and retracting those issues, those papers and doing all that, getting the word out about it, which Martin's going to talk about in a moment. Um, but we also need to look way upstream and think about why this, why people have an incentive to do this. Um, that's a harder problem. It's an even harder problem, I should say. Um, happy to talk more about it uh, in, the, in the discussion. So thank you all very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I guess I have that slide, but I'm, I can get rid of that. I'm trying to stop sharing and I'm on the wrong screen. There we go. Okay, now I've stopped sharing. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Ivan. Can we turn it over to Martin? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'll share my, my screen and uh, get my slides up. And then we can, uh, I can, uh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's great to, uh, to follow on from, from Ivan. And I think our, what I'm going to say will hopefully complement, uh, what he said and, and come in from a slightly, um, different point of view. Um, I'm going to talk about the integrity of the scholarly record, which is a, a specific part of research integrity, um, a little bit, a few more details around the the relationship between Crossref and, and Retraction Watch, um, what you can what you can do with all this data, all these retractions, and and then a little bit of um, speculation and um, tentative speculation. I think as, as Ivan 
um, was, was also said. Um, so firstly, uh, a brief intro introduction to Crossref. If, if you're not familiar with us, we are a, a DOI registration agency. Um, we collect metadata from publishers. So this is typically uh, uh, research, um, research articles, books, preprints, conference papers, these, these kind of research outputs. Um, and you know we collect the we collect the metadata and we make that available for downstream use and and this is our our mission here so we you know we make research outputs easy to find cite link assess and reuse and of course that goes for retractions as, as well um, and we're a, we're a not for profit we have a broad membership and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about our our membership later on. And so before we before we go further, I've got a, I put a poll in the um, the Hoover app or on the on the website. Um, I might, if I can find the chat, be able to uh, to, to give a link to the the website. Um, that's that's possible. There you go. Um, uh, and there's a poll which is yeah, which which themes that do you think will be important to research integrity in the next five years? And it's a word cloud response. They just put one or two. Um, keywords into um, into that. Um, I'll maybe give you a few seconds to find that now, um, and and then um, I'm going to come back to it later in the talk. So if you can't find it immediately, then uh, uh, you know you can uh, you can multitask and, uh, and and listen to me and find that at the same time. Um, I didn't see any responses coming in yet. Is that because it's tricky to find, or is oh no, there's some responses there now. So, yeah, that's that's cool. Okay. Yeah. Right. I can see. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll show you all of the all of the results a little bit later. Um, I can see. Yeah. Reproducibility, open peer review, data sharing, um, transparency, and uh, and so on. Okay. So I said um, we would talk about integrity of the scholarly record. So we we collect metadata, and and we want to make sure that the metadata that we have is an accurate reflection of the research outputs that it represents. This doesn't necessarily mean that the research outputs themselves are correct or flawed or not flawed. Um, it's about how we can accurately represent that. And um, that means really two things. Firstly, it means collecting comprehensive metadata, find you know, as much as we can as, as we can. And secondly, it means keeping it up to date. So if something changes about a, an output that um, you know, we can change that in our records as well. Uh, and you can think of, of metadata, I guess, in the in the abstract as a kind of like a network with with nodes which have which have properties. So that might be you know, a research article with a title, uh, an abstract, maybe volume, issue number and, and so on. And then there's also relationships between research items. Uh, so that might be, you know, one one item cites another, a retraction notice retracts something linked to an organization or funding, um, and so on. Um, oh yeah, I should mention before, sorry, before I move on, that there's a there's a there's a series of blog posts from from my colleague Amanda Bartel around integrity of the scholarly record. So you can see what that means to to Crossref and, and how we interpret that. That's that's available on our on our blog. So we've kind of generalized this idea of connections between metadata into what we call the research nexus. Um, and so hopefully you can read this, it might be a bit small, but on the inside of this diagram, you've got research outputs, which are you know articles, books, data sets, um, posters, images, theses, those kinds of things, but also people and organizations. And in the digital world, you know, all of those things can have identifiers associated with them or at, very, at the very least a, a URL. Uh, and around the outside, we've got the, the actions which might happen to those items or ways in which they can be connected. So for example, you know, a grant funds a piece of research, um, a person authors um, a, a, a piece of research, maybe some there's a, there's a comment or um, you know, a, a citation or something is translated and so on. And we can, we can connect research outputs in that way and, and and build this this kind of network of, of outputs, which isn't just about crossref um crossref items, it's it's about the whole uh scholarly communications um, um community and, and, and infrastructure. 
and, and of course that 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 now to kind of go narrow in on on retractions you know this applies very much to retractions we want to find out when something has been retracted and connect the retraction notices to the items that have been retracted and i just want to kind of show this um show this here as uh, as, a, as an example of, of of how it's relatively simple to connect those things within the metadata although I'll, as i'll talk about later it's also not quite as straightforward as it, as it might look um, but I think the first point to make is that any Crossref member can register a retraction. I think in the past, sometimes retractions have been tied up with us talking about Crossmark, which is one of the products that we offer. And that involves other obligations and other things that you, you can add to your website and to PDFs. But that's not necessary to just simply register a, a retraction. So you can add this bit of, um, of XML into a, a, a metadata deposit. Um, and you can just see here the update type is retraction. Um, there's a date and then just the DOI of the thing that's being retracted. So, so this goes into the metadata of the of the retraction notice. That might seem pretty technical, especially if you're not used to looking at XML. Um, but there's there's another option as well, which is with our web deposit form. This is just a UI uh, where, where your user interface where you can enter the details of the retraction notice. There's a section which is add Crossmark metadata. Um, again, you don't need to sign up to everything within Crossmark to do this, but you can just add update type is a retraction and which retraction, which DOI is your retraction notice um, updating. And uh, you know this might be a good option if you, even if you're a publisher who typically deposits metadata using XML, what we find is that retractions and corrections more generally uh, often happen outside of the normal editorial process and production um, workflows don't incorporate retractions. And, and this is one of the diff difficulties with, with adding them because they're a relatively rare thing that is kind of an afterthought to, to add them. So even if you're depositing with XML, you may want to have a look at um, uh, 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 using the UI to register retraction notices. Um, so now moving on to to retraction watch and and there's a, a lot that we that we have in common and and there's a lot where we kind of complement each other as well and I think uh, you know it's a really good fit for for, for Crossref and uh, you know I'm, I'm I don't want to speak for Ivan but you know I think he, he feels the same for uh, for retraction watch. Um, so you know we have all of the retractions that we know about come from member deposited metadata. So our members need to send us the metadata of the retraction, otherwise we don't know about it. Whereas Retraction Watch are going out, looking for retractions, collecting them, curating them, um, checking the details. And there's a lot of manual work, but it's it, it's very it's a very valuable um, piece of work that they're doing. Um, we have um, open data and open APIs. All of the data that we have is, is open. That's one of the principles and one of the, uh, it's actually one of the things that, um, you know, there's a benefit to our members, so there's just one place for all of the metadata from you know, from from um, the the majority of of scholarly publishers. Whereas you know Retraction Watch, in order to fund their um, the collection and curation process, yeah, you know, they were providing uh, their database via um, a subscription model. Um, but in both both cases, you know, we have an audience for our data. If you like, you know, we have a good metadata user base. We have a lot of downstream services that are using Crossref metadata. And Retraction Watch built a subscriber base, which was able to, you know, to support their work to a to a large degree. And so this is maybe kind of the where we get to the the main benefit for uh, for Crossref is that we know that we have a substantial number of retractions missing because we rely on our members to deposit the metadata, and maybe they kind of they don't realize that it's possible that you know they 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 forget to do it, or there are other reasons you know it's techn technically difficult for them. Um, and Retraction Watch actually have substantially more retractions in their database um, than, than we do. Despite those contrasts and differences, you know, we have compatible goals and values. We want retractions to be visible. We want them um, to be found by people who are reading works um, in various contexts, not just on the publisher website, but all over the place. And, and that's why there's kind of a lot of value to working together. Um, so just to kind of reiterate the point about how many retractions there are out there, um, uh, Ivan, Ivan said, you know, they've just hit 50,000 retractions in total. And this is just a graph, you know, since 2010, how many retractions we have. We only have, to, we, you know, we only have 29,000 
um, retractions or so. And, and if you compare pretty much every year on this graph, there are more retractions in, in the retraction watch database than there are in the Crossref database. And that's why we, you know, we found this is, is a really you know, useful resource. Um, the last couple of years is, is slightly different. And I think that's probably due to just a, a lag in the collection of, uh, of, of retractions at Retraction Watch. Um, and, you know, especially the Hindawi, a lot of the Hindawi retractions are right at the end of last year. So I think they're probably still being processed. Um, so yeah, we we formed an agreement. We you know we cooperate, and so Crossref now owns the Retraction Watch um, database. Um, just distinguish that does not include the the blog and the kind of journalistic side of Retraction Watch. That that continues as its as its own thing and separate entity. Um, but in terms of the database, that's now owned by Crossref. We have a five year agreement, um, and and that in that agreement we're supporting the collection and curation of the data set and we are able to open the data set which uh, you know is a benefit to us and to uh, retraction watch and hopefully to the the scholarly um, communicate community uh, more broadly so where are we at the moment so the um the there's a csv file that contains all of the retraction watch um, database, which is available from the uh, the URL that you see on the screen here. You just have to add your own email on the end, and and it will it will download it. Um, we are looking to uh, put that into an API alongside our other metadata, and there's an experimental labs API at the moment. Um, this is I would emphasize the experimental nature of this. The schema is liable to change. There are, uh, you know, it doesn't have a huge uh, amount of resources behind it, so you know you can't hammer it every every couple of minutes and uh, or you know several times a second. That's going to take it down. Uh, but you know, if you want to have a look at the data in an API, you can you can do that. Um, and you know, the last few months since we signed the agreement, we've been solving a few teething issues around the data transfer, some um, some uh, uh, is issues with the um, the encoding uh, of, of of text and and so on. Um, where do we want to be in the future? So, you know, we think there's a great there's great value in basically putting this data together really side by side, uh, putting it into a cauldron, mixing it together and, and see what magic uh, comes out of it. Uh, there's, there's certainly benefit to, you know, enhancing the retraction watch data with all the other metadata that we have about a retraction or about retracted works. And for, you know, for Crossref, uh, anyone using our APIs would be able to see a lot more retractions um, there and, and that will, you know, the aim is to put this to through our production APIs and that to be um, available there um, with identification of the source of retraction. So you'll be able to see was this um, a retraction that a member has, has deposited or is this a retraction that's been found through um, Retraction Watch. Uh, and we also hope that, you know, this will raise the profile of retractions and that there will be more retraction metadata uh, coming from our members. Um, so yeah, this data is available, it's out there, it's public, you can get it for free. Um, essentially, you can do anything that you like with it. Um, you, you know, you don't have to tell us, um, but you, you know, you can do, get in touch with me, get in touch with uh, uh, with Ivan or, or, or colleagues and, and tell us the exciting things that you're, that you're doing with the Retraction Watch data. Um, and you know, we also request that if you use it, especially in research, that you're, you're citing it so people can see, um, you know, the source of your, your data. Um, you can get updates on a daily basis. Uh, it's it's being updated once a day, so you don't need to be querying, you know, downloading the data set once an hour. You won't see too many changes there, but you will on a daily basis. Um, Ivan's already touched on some of the uses that have already been put into place of the Retraction Watch data set. Um, so you'll see, you know, just a few examples of Tiro, EndNote, Clarivate. You will see a, a trend there that these are all organizations that run bibliographic software. So when you you want to cite something, put it into your your um, draft, and and you see, oh, this thing has been retracted. Maybe you need to you know go back and have a look and see if that affects your conclusions, or you need another source for the information. Um, Get FDR is an, is a service that um, identifies whether you have access to subscription um, and uh, or, or or open access um, publications and. Uh, alongside the link to the full text of a um, of, of a piece of research, they're also notifying if it's been retracted or, or corrected using um, you know using our metadata. 
Uh, and we've been in touch, we've been contacted by several researchers who are really excited about the, the fact that the, the data set is open now um, and are doing things like you know, matching ORCIDs or raw IDs to um, people and organizations so that there's a, um, a little bit more deduplication de de and better identification of exactly who is um, publishing works that have been retracted and you know, which organizations they, they belong to. And we have a, a community forum, and there's a section of that community forum dedicated to um, research integrity. And I put the link on the the slide here. That's uh, or, or you can Google for it. You know that that's a um, a great place to discuss issues around research integrity, or if you have questions um, around the Retraction Watch database or retractions more more generally, um, you know we can discuss there. So the last few minutes, I'm just going to talk about what the future holds, um, uh, and I'm I'm just going to pre prefix this with um, uh, with the the image on the left here. This is not a crystal ball. This is not an accurate prediction of what will happen. This is a this is a snow globe which will maybe give you you know 30 seconds to a minute of uh, of excitement, and then you need to check back again. That's probably about you know the time scale of, of of any predictions that I'm going to make. But I'm going to launch into them anyway. So firstly, five years is a, is a long time for the agreement that we have with Retraction Watch, um, and that shows the commitment from both sides. And I think the you know the the um, the the uh, co collaboration and the way that that, that our, our goals align here. Um, and unless something really drastically changes, you know, we'd expect to to extend that agreement beyond that time. Um, and it's also a model that we can see using for for other data sources that are outside of of um of crossref members we know that there are other places where there there is information not necessarily in terms of research integrity all sorts of of, of links that that will help us complete this research nexus vision um that we have and you know to be able to collaborate uh, on a relatively formal basis with other organizations to add that metadata um to our um to our apis and, and the publicly available sources that we have, um, we think is a, is a benefit and, and something that we can do more of going forward. Um, so yeah, I'll just um, pick up on the um, uh, on, on the poll again, and I should be able to um, get the get the results. Um, let me just see if I can download a file and uh, I okay, so <clears throat> yeah, here, here we are that um, so we've got yeah themes of reproducibility, transparency, open peer review, data sharing, artificial intelligence, incentives. This is yeah I, I think it's uh, that's um, a pretty good list. Um, I asked one of my colleagues, um, Fabien Michaud, who does uh, a lot around um, uh, research integrity as well, especially on the side of Authenticate, and and she gave me th this list, um, which is you know. Uh, amazingly optimistic and positive, as you can see, you know, citation manipulation, authorship for sale, peer review manipulation, artificial intelligence, again, uh, fake data, allegations of misconduct. And she she also mentioned maybe allegations of misconduct where, you know, there, there's an agenda behind that as well. Um, uh, and, and these are certainly themes that we'll want to, to keep tabs on. But I think there's also another side as well, and hopefully a more positive um, side. So I think you know uh, retraction metadata and retraction information is getting getting more attention, um, and I think the work that the NISO CREC group has done is really interesting. If you're involved in in retractions in some way, um, then I highly recommend that you read that report. If you haven't done so far, it talks about how to present retractions and how to process inf uh, retraction information from a from a this point of view of a number of different stakeholders. Um, including publishers and, and funders and, and so on. Um, and I think that that ties into the next bullet point that I have here, which is about education of the publishing community. So we have a very broad, we have more than 20,000 members now uh, at Crossref. Um, and there's a, a drift towards um, smaller uh, smaller members from really across the, across the globe. Um, you know, we, we are not now dominated by you know, the top few very large um, publishers, but there's a there's a large number of small organizations who don't necessarily identify themselves as publishers. They may be research institutions 
or NGOs or museums, and they have a publishing arm. And for these organizations, because they're, they're small, retraction and correction is something which happens very rarely. Um, and they may not be prepared for that happening, and they may not know how to handle these issues when, when they do happen. Um, and I think the scope for um, looking at this, you know, this very long tail of publishing organizations and educating them about what to do um, in, uh, in, in, in the situation where retraction or a need for, uh, for investigation um, of a retraction arises. And I think the NISO QUEC guidelines are, are a great um, starting point for that as well and, and something that can be continued. Um, yeah, um, I think it's definitely what Ivan said, more retractions. And I think from Crossref's point of view, more visible retractions as well. We want to have that metadata. We want to share that metadata. Uh, and that's why we decided to, to collaborate with Retraction Watch. Um, and I think another area is maybe more granular information around retractions uh, and perhaps being able to you know, separate more these retractions for misconduct from retractions for other kinds of, of reasons. Um, uh, and you know, Retraction Watch have their own taxonomy that there is, is tried and tested within the, the database. Um, and there was an interesting uh, preprint published in February this year from Leslie McIntosh and Cynthia Huston Vital. And, and there's a diagram from there on the left where um, they've they've um, categorized reasons for retractions into uh, into a, a number of different categories. And I, I think um, it's not something I think we should rush into saying, OK, we need to implement this tomorrow, but to just um, see if we can you know, separate out the different different types of retractions. So I'm just going to finish with one concluding thought, which is, you know, if you want to investigate issues around research integrity, if you want to know the outcomes of investigations around research integrity, if you want to be informed about when work has been updated, corrected, retracted, or expressions of concern and so on, then really you need open data and that needs to be shared widely, um, not just on a publisher website, but you know, in search results, in bibliography lists, in you know, in 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 articles, maybe in you know the reference list of an article, and the, there's there's a lot of, of scope for um for sharing this um, information more widely, and I think that can only be um, a good thing. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention. I think we can move now on to uh, the discussion um, phase. Great, thank you, Martin. Um, very interesting stuff. Uh, really great presentation by both of you. Uh, I'm going to move on to a couple of questions that have appeared in the Q of A, the Q and A on the Whova site. And I think this first one's for Ivan. Uh, why the increased rise in conference paper retractions in 2023? There seemed to be quite a large spike in the data um, in what you showed in your early slides. Um, I don't know that the increase, I mean, I'm not sure I'm going to look at my slides to see if I said something I didn't mean. I, the um, I'm not seeing any increase in conference paper retractions in mm -hmm. I mean, there was some there was a bump in in 2022. Um, but actually, that wasn't really a bump. I, I think uh, it's it's what people are counting. Uh, I don't want to get lost in the weeds of the conference papers thing, because in fact, the big bump in conference paper uh, retractions was in from 2009 to 2011. We're not actually quite sure about when they happened because IEEE, who's the publisher in this case, retracted actually 7,000 papers between those years uh, that were published in those years, originally published in those years. Um, they, to be frank, did not follow great practice there. And so the, the, there's the metadata are really missing. Um, that was probably for fake peer review and things like that. But yeah, there were some in 2022 because that was something people were looking at. I, I wouldn't read too much into it. The, the large increase in 2023, though, is, as, as we, I think, both discussed, was this was Hindawi, um, you know, about 11,000 retractions all at once uh, or over that period of time, over that year, um, because of paper mills. So um, I'm happy to follow up with whomever asked that, uh, maybe just to make sure I'm understanding the question. But I, I see what you mean about, but if you go back in time uh, further than that nature um, graphic did, 
um, you'll actually see that there were th these thousands of retractions, which uh, we wrote about back in 2018 in, in science, um, actually. Okay, and the next question, um, with articles now being related to so many interim research projects, products like preprints, data sets, conference presentations, standalone infographics, et cetera, are there ways for retraction and correction info to cascade to other objects related to the retracted paper? And Martin, I mean, generally I would say yes, but I think Martin, you may be able to answer more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess it, yeah, it is a really difficult problem. Um, and it's something which I think is only, you know, being started to be talked about and kind of recognized as as, as an issue. Um, uh, and I, I think the, you know, probably go back to my last slide, making the data open and making these relationships open and collecting these relationships allows you to kind of navigate through the metadata to find, you know, if you've got a preprint you you can you can find research you know the research article that that's linked to or other versions of the preprint um and and or data sets and see if something related to it to it has been retracted um i, I think it's something which in theory is possible uh I, I think in in practice it may need a little bit more support for you know for organizations that are publishing these these items to um to actually be able to do it in practice yeah, and actually, I just would add, Martin. You know, I, it, it's 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 a lot like what, at least my perception, <clears throat> like what you know, Crossmark, which I guess now is you know, check for updates, is is of course doing, uh, it has been doing for a long time, um, but only on the you know, a publishers have to sort of sign up for it, you know, actually decide to do it, uh, and also it's going to be limited to big events. Uh, but I think to the point of the question, yeah, there's, I mean. In a perfect world, I'd love to see everything reflected in all the right places. What that means, uh, and as you probably all know, or I'll tell you, I'm not a, a technical person at all. I think that's there's a lot of a lot of work to be done. Good work to be done. But yeah. so I'm I'm curious. I mean, you say that we um, have a reporting rate uh, of something like two tenths of one percent right now of of articles or at least that was the number i saw and that the the more accurate number of articles that should be retracted is two percent instead of two tenths and one percent so you know if we're seeing ten percent of of what's actually out there uh recorded do you see us ever getting to two percent i mean and how do we get there to full reporting of retracted articles i know there's a bunch of different reasons but is there some kind of incentive or um, arrangement that makes sense that you know people will quickly and um, accurately report to Retraction Watch, so that or or Crossref's uh, product, you know, growing out of Retraction Watch, so that it can be used as a, a reference point. If it's in Retraction Watch, then it's it's retracted. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I I, I think there are two separate things going on though, right? So one is whether or not Word or Crossref is um, actually learning of all the retractions that do happen. Um, and I think as the numbers that, that Martin showed suggest, <clears throat> A, things are actually getting better, and I'll get to that in a second. But, you know, I, I'm not, uh, again, when we are finished inputting all the Indawi retractions from the last couple of years, which we've now built some, you know, we've actually used some of the uh, you know, the resources made available from this acquisition to to build some uh, tools for that. So that should be accelerating and it, it'll happen. I, I can't promise exactly when, but I'm hoping sometime, you know, this year we'll catch up, but we'll probably be at say 55, 56. And by then, by the end of the year, maybe 60,000 retractions. I don't claim that that is every single retraction. Um, I'm pretty confident that it's well above 90%. Um, but even that, um, that's just a, a, a sort of good guess. Um, but the, the, you know, in the end, when, when you look at Martin's data, uh, the data that Martin presented, it's, they're roughly 27,000, 29,000, I think it is now. So again, it's some fraction of that, not a, you know, it's half, it's more than half. Um, so I think there's that, which is that, that is literally, if you think about it, we're able to find them, um, publishers didn't give the information to Crossref. I mean, it's actually that sort of simple. So, 
Uh, and I know Crossref is, and I don't want to speak for them, but is, has always been interested in making sure that happens more and is thinking about ways to do that and incentivize it and just make it part of practice. But I think it gets back to one, in terms of that, it gets back to something Martin said, which is that systems are not set up for this, right? So they they weren't built for attractions. As systems like Scholarly, uh, um, Scholar One and, and you know, Aries and, and, and sort of manuscript managers and, uh, you know, are upgraded, just like you upgrade any software, hopefully that's built in and that, that that will hopefully help, both in terms of getting their attraction done, which we'll get to in a second, and and promulgating the metadata. In terms of getting their attractions done that should be done, that is a, it's a, it, honestly, it's a cultural problem, right? It's, it's, this is not a technological fix. I mean, there's some technological fix probably for part of it, but it's a cultural problem. Right. It is, you know, people talk about destigmatizing, then they get into sort of categorizing retractions. And I, I get it, have some issues with that. But I, I mean, destigmatizing, you know, might help in some way, uh, pointing out that people don't actually face a sort of sanction punishment if they retract for honest error. And it's clear about that. Um, but it's a cultural problem. And it's sort of, you know, not being, quite frankly, so afraid of attorneys not being so afraid of legal threats, which most of the time go absolutely nowhere, but can obviously be very draining and I get it. Um, so, you know, I think there's just, that's a cultural problem. Um, but I think that we can almost leapfrog it if we are all deliberative, you know, deliberate about this and intentional, we can almost leapfrog the, let's get everything that should be retracted, retracted. I don't think we're gonna do this and I don't actually necessarily think it's the best idea, but there is a world where we leapfrog that and say, Let's reflect what's actually happened since this paper was published and before this paper was published and sort of reflect that in some way, getting back to the previous question about sort of, you know, can we actually attach the relevant metadata at all the right points it, so that we can honestly, and this may sound strange coming from someone who co-founded Retraction Watch, but kind of not need to think about retraction anymore. In other words, think about like the larger picture and the larger, now again, that's leapfrogging, it's complicated and it's maybe even utopian. So I get that, but I think that it would reflect actually how we wanna, how I think anyway, and I think a lot of other people think that the scholarly literature should be, it should be a living organism. It should not be sort of, you know, you know, retractions should not be, um, you know, sort of, headstones, you know, tombstones, the, the retraction should be a bit of metadata, a bit of information that informs what you're doing next in your work. Yeah, I think I just had a couple of couple of lines to that. I mean, I, I, I really, I really like preprints. And you know, the idea that you can kind of iterate on a preprint and, and that, you know, that improves the work. And it's not that you're retracting the previous thing, you're just changing it and improving it. So you don't have that kind of negative um, you know, negative connotation that, that comes with retraction. You know, this is a line in the sand. I've published something. It will last forever. Oh, no, it's not going to. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like a knocking down a wall rather than just, you know, a piece of paper. Um, but the, the other thing I was going to say is we, you know, looking at, uh, I've mentioned Crossmark, and we've we've been looking at Crossmark this year because there's been a relatively low uptake of, of Crossmark. Publishers aren't putting it on their website, and we're looking at you know, why that is. And, um well, you know, one of the th one of the questions that we asked in that in, in that consultation was, you know, how do retractions happen? What's the process? Who's involved? And we found that, you know, a lot of a lot of publishers really struggle to articulate the process that they use to handle complaints and get to get from the first complaint through to a retraction notice being published. Um, and also that there was a number of different people in the organization involved in that. So it is a difficult it's a difficult process to manage especially if it's something that you're not doing very often um and it's it's complex both technically and in terms of you know managing the process within within a, a, an organization so i think how do we get to kind of more retractions being being made and as many as possible i think we may need to make it as simple as possible to retract things and as simple as possible to notify people about those retractions and yeah you know, we don't have all the answers yet but we're we're kind of you know, throwing a few ideas around about how we can how we can make it uh, you know more simple and more obvious
Well, thanks. Uh, I, I see a comment from Rebecca Hadrian. Uh, I'd love to be able to get a notice if anything I've cited has a retraction or expression of concern after my own publication, that is. Uh, is there any kind of tools or anything like that that's going on? Yeah, uh, th that's actually been available uh, since uh, 2019 uh, through Zotero. Um, you can also use EndNote uh, papers. Um, there are others now that actually, again, have taken advantage of the, the, the fact that the, the database is now uh, completely open. Uh, but basically, if you take, if you input, you know, if you're using one of those and all of your references are already in one of those uh, managers, then you don't actually have to do anything. Uh, but if you make a point of uh, including all of the references that you've um, that you've used in a particular paper or just in your work in general, make a point of including them in, again, something like Zotero or EndNote, uh, you'll get a ping. You'll just get an alert um, automatically if something's retracted even 20 years later. Uh, so that's uh, it's one of it's one of it was one of our sort of uh, dream wish cases, uh, dream use cases, excuse, dream wish case, dream use cases for um, the data when we first were envisioning the project. Um, and so uh, when when Zotero said, "Hey, we want to do this," we were we were really delighted. Okay, I want to put out a 